Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2022 Our Ocean Conference. The bed, Marad, Maungil Garul. A ele balu angal tangatara blad gamaru el narbab. A ele ngungi la the bed of toys el adlo la waite del garu el merablu. A ele aut mamse adla adle ngula talo el. E olta ga wabalu madalango Mabilungil, mabilungil, mabilungil ay galbalu Mabilungil, mabilungil, mabilungil ay galbalu Legend and lore tell us that we came from the ocean. The story of Palau begins with the sea. For over 3,000 years, through generations of practice, every story, every lesson has been passed on so that we may survive, endure, and thrive. From traditional practices such as bull to cutting-edge scientific research to community-led marine protection, Palau and other small island states are on the front lines, combating climate-related impacts on the ocean and marine pollution. Creating marine protected areas and strengthening maritime security. Building sustainable fisheries and sustainable blue economies. Palau has always turned to the sea for answers. And now, the world must come together to create innovative solutions, transition to sustainable practices, and build collaborative partnerships, ensuring a sustainable future for our ocean, our people, and our prosperity. On behalf of Palau and the United States, welcome to Our Ocean Palau. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for Mr. Gulas Remeli with our conch shell opening horn and the Ngara Amayong dancers for our opening performance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, remember to share your experience. Tweet your highlights and experiences and amplify your impact to our virtual community by using hashtag OurOceanPalau and our handle at OurOceanPalau.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the Republic of Palau, His Excellency, Sarangal S. Whips, Jr. Malungil tu tau, ego te bodo susra y budul, ma rubukul de a raklay, ma rubukul belau, bilum ebi raklay, ma masil belau, vice president, ma rubukul ministers, president tras senet, senator baules, ma rubukul senators, speaker nastasio, ma rubukul delegates. Uh, governors, leitors, Marbek la other bela on Artiar el Alto Tau. E culturge Bogumodu, Toram Rigel, Mortigal Okiak Sangar Gidre el Alcils. Ali, and welcome to Palau and the opening of the seventh Our Oceans Conference. We are grateful to all heads of state, foreign ministers, ambassadors, indigenous peoples, and local communities, youth delegates, civil society representatives, academic experts, industry leaders, concerned citizens, and everyone who has come from far and near to join us on this long overdue and historic gathering. We are greatly appreciative of the partnerships with the United States, led by Special Envoy Kerry, and the generous contributions from our friends, the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the Nippon Foundation, and the many others that have come together to help us in hosting this event today. These partnerships are an example of the, of the collective response that we need to effectively address our global issues. For me, like many Palauans, and millions of people from ocean communities around the world, our connection to the ocean is very personal. Our lives, cultures, and economies are inherently shaped by the ocean as a provider and a protector. It's our home. It's our lifeline. It's what makes us who we are. It was a huge victory at COP26 to finally see the ocean taking a more central role in the climate change dialogues. The Glasgow Pact validated the bitter reality that ocean and coastal communities bear the brunt of climate change. We should not be paralyzed by the magnitude of this problem. It is unavoidable. Just last year, around this same time, as I have shared, Typhoon Surige swept through Palau, destroyed millions of dollars in Agriculture ravaged the aquaculture facility, destroyed 20% of our infrastructure, and homes were flooded, roads were blocked, utilities were down. And we're just so fortunate this week that the storm passed north and didn't come through Palau. But that's the reality that we live in as island states. So the threat is real, and, the, and it is real to those of us on small island developing states. Humankind has more recently grasp a deeper appreciation for the ocean and its existential value. It's plain and simple. It literally allows us to breathe by providing 50% of the Earth's oxygen. It's a source of food and the primary source of protein for our ocean communities. And according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, over 3 billion people rely on ocean for their livelihoods. Friends. We are not dealing with a climate crisis, but we're also encountering a humanitarian crisis. Our ocean, the previous Our Oceans conferences and other global platforms have helped us understand the special relationship we all have to the ocean and why it is importantly important that we take radical action to protect it. Albert Einstein uh, once said, sometimes the easiest way to solve a problem 
is to stop participating in the problem. This reminds us all that we must be part of the solution. We have to take a hard look at ourselves and live responsibly as individuals and as nations. We are, pre we are past negotiating for commitments. It's time we act on those commitments that we have made. With the theme, our ocean, our people, our pro pro prosperity, this conference offers us the space to confront our realities, accept the contradictions, and align our actions and our resources and our energy with commitments. It's time to address the climate ocean crisis from the perspective of opportunities and solutions. The climate ocean crisis poses a unique case for SIDS and coastal communities whose economic and social well-being depend on the ocean. As leaders, we are often faced with difficult choices. How do we meet the needs of our people and protect the valuable resources that we have? A wise fisherman from Kayangal once told me, he says, Simply put, how do you expect me to protect the Napoleon wrasse and the bumphead parrotfish when I must fish to survive? The moral dilemma seeks to find the balance between protection and production. Ladies and gentlemen, the demonstrations happening at the margins of this conference reflect Palau's healthy democracy. We believe in freedom of speech and the diversity of ideas. We believe that we should always be open to healthy and robust discussions. Palau, like other indigenous peoples and local communities, has had a long history of ocean stewardship and natural resource management. The Palauan Bull is a traditional practice that manages and helps restore balance to our fragile ecosystems. The Bull is grounded in the traditional conservation practices and mixed management methods that respond to change and external pressures. Our moral obligation to protect the land and the sea is ingrained in our traditional system. This sense of duty as ocean stewards has continued throughout our history and is reflected in our contemporary legal frameworks. The first modern law establishing that established the spirit of the bull was the Ngurugwith Wildlife Reserve in 1956, or better known as the 70 Islands, the world famous uh, picture that we always see on all the postcards. Two decades later, I remember traveling with my dad and going around Palau and the fight to stop the superport from coming and invading the northern reefs, which are so precious that we've seen. Palau then continued its, its stance and ratified the first nuclear-free constitution. Since then, Palau has continued its stewardship by instituting a number of policies that manage our ocean spatially, temporarily, by species, and by practices. The onset of COVID-19 and the impacts of climate change and the loss of revenues due to the PNMS have dealt a triple blow to Palau. As a result, our government has had to reduce essential public services and pile on more debt, which now is equivalent to our GDP. Palau's national budget dilemma, I'm sure, resonates across the whole Pacific and the world as we pursue recovery from COVID-19. The past couple of years have exposed the need for Palau to improve and upgrade our chartered course by designing and executing a plan to model the next generation of fisheries while maintaining the integrity of the sanctuary's protection in ways that can be replicated, hopefully across Micronesia, the Pacific region, and the world. In, in the weeks leading up to this Our Ocean event, Palau has come up with a three-year initial plan that can support the design, the implementation of adaptive management systems for the next generation of fisheries. We believe that you can 
sell less and make more. Preserve more and make more. Palau tuna to the world that is harvested in keeping with our values with greater benefit ultimately to the people. The plan maintains the integrity of the PNMS for a three-year period as marine spatial planning and regional no-take areas at scale can be designed and agreed to be, to be based upon science and guided by traditional values that respect the ocean as, li as a life-giving entity whose health is our health. With this plan in place and support from a growing network of, of civil society, namely our friends from the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, Neotero, the Blue Nature Alliance, and a friend of ours who we just met um, a couple weeks ago, Chris Larson from Ripple Labs, who just said, can a million dollars help? And I said, absolutely. It's that kind of commitment that we need. It's partnership that we need. That when we are confident that Palau can carry the spirit of the sanctuary forward alongside a more diverse and vibrant blue economy where production of resources and the protection of the ocean life are positively reinforcing. I'd like to close with a Palauan legend. And it's the, it's the story of a giant snake from the village of Eleui in Aimali. The snake would smell food being cooked and would come into the village and terrorize the village and steal food and sometimes take people. The villagers tried to do everything to stop it. Spears, traps, any, any matter in which to stop it they thought of, that they knew. Finally, they fled out of fear, except for a mother and her two sons. The sons thought out of the box. They were a bit innovative. And they said, well, this is a hungry snake. Let's build a fire, heat rocks until they become red hot. And the next time the snake came, they fed him the rocks. The snake swallowed the rocks, then went into the ocean, uh, was uh, shaking violently, and punched a hole through one of the rock islands, which you'll see on Friday, that's 100 feet in diameter. Like those brothers, we must be bold and creative to determine the right actions to take to address our circumstances. We cannot solve these problems with the same tactics. The environment is changing rapidly. Foreign policies and other global pressures are directly impacting our domestic well-being. Success will depend on every country, every individual, taking responsibility for their actions. Everybody has a role to play. Just like we rallied around COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and the attack on Ukraine, we must act united. We must act with a united response to climate change and the climate crisis and take f and fulfill our commitments with practical solutions and innovative actions to rally around our ocean, our people, our prosperity. Komad Musulang, thank you and God bless you all. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, the Honorable John F. Kerry. President Webb, thank you so much. Um, thank you for those bold and important comments. And I know everybody here is deeply appreciative for uh, your leadership, for the Palauan welcome, 
uh, for all that you have done to create this incredible atmosphere for this meeting. And we are deeply, deeply appreciative to the people of Palau, indigenous peoples, to all uh, who have come here for this important conference, distinguished ministers from so many different countries, environment, energy, otherwise, uh, NGOs, private sector representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. This is indeed a genuinely historic event. Uh, the first ever Our Ocean Conference held in a small island developing nation. Uh, we are often, we're often, uh, for those of us in developed countries and from far off places, it's very easy to sometimes reference the plight of people in the small island states, in the developing states. But it is hard to fully uh, define the many ways in which these folks are on the front lines. President Whips has just shared with us uh, some of that. Uh, but on a daily basis, uh, life can be trying and complicated. And so uh, we embrace our brothers and sisters here, our friends, and all of us have come here with a view not to point fingers, not to cast blame, but to find uh, the way forward in a very complex, uh, dangerous world. I think it's safe to say that we are very proud to be here. Uh, and so many of you need to be congratulated for enduring uh, a 30 hour plus several day journey. Um, it's not the usual fare for attending a conference. Um, and we congratulate you on not just enduring the 30 hours, but actually finding Palau at the other end of your trip. Um, I will say advisedly that everybody here is a qualified, certified hard ass. Thank you. Um, I'm personally very delighted to be here on behalf of uh, the United States and President Joe Biden, who is uh, deeply committed uh, to conquer the challenge of the climate crisis, and it is one and the same, as you know. So thank you, uh, thank you, President Whips, for your incredible hospitality here. Uh, thank you for your leadership over the past few years as we have had to bounce this meeting uh, from one moment to the next, and even this year uh, postponed for a period of time. Uh, I thank our incredible teams. Uh, both of us have had uh, outstanding individuals who have been deeply committed to this endeavor with site visits and planning and this extraordinary screen behind us and the clarity of the images that we were just watching as we sat here uh, helps to share with all of us that primal sense of wonder that captures anybody who goes down to the sea. There is also no way to gather here without acknowledging the evil that is unfolding in Ukraine to acknowledge the extraordinary courage of the Ukrainian people, the obligation of all of us to stand up for freedom, for human rights, for sovereignty of nations, for the independence of nations, under the United Nations, community of nations, and also particularly for the rule of law. Some people have worried that what is happening in Ukraine could divert us from our mission. I think there's a contrary view. Our mission is even more urgent now. Now is the time to accelerate the transition to independent and a clean energy future. President Putin cannot control the power of the wind or the sun. So this week, my friends, our goal in these next two days is to spotlight what is happening to our ocean. As I think everybody felt looking at those incredible images over the last 15 minutes, uh, we are all of us always moved by the passion that accompanies our affinity for the ocean 
and by the sense of awe that we hold for this 71% of planet Earth's uh, surface and below the surface, obviously. The ocean uh, has always been magical to people. You can go back through all of literature. And we were reminded by Achilles in the Iliad, the ocean is the source of all. So it is fair to say that the ocean is our lifeblood. 51% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. So much of the food that we eat, so many of the livelihoods that are provided to people come from the ocean. It is a $500 billion global economy and the livelihoods of at least one out of every 10 persons on the planet is tied directly to the ocean. Millions of citizens around the world depend on the ocean for the protein that they consume or for the livelihoods that feed their families, keep them alive. We realize, all of us, and, and believe, particularly looking at the beauty that we were just watching, incredible photography, we see that uh, uh, the ocean is an ecosystem. An ecosystem. That means it's interconnected. It works each part dependent on the other part. It, it, it demands that it be protected as an entity. The Ocean Conference, the Our Ocean Conference, was created in 2014 with the realization by so many people that not enough was being done by anyone anywhere to protect this extraordinary resource, this thing upon which we depend for life itself. Not enough was being done to create the commitments necessary in order to make the promises real. Not enough was being done to create the kind of accountability that the challenge demands. Not enough was being done to protect this delicate interconnection of an ecosystem. This conference, unlike many around the planet, is not about negotiated outcomes like COP, the many, the 26 COPs we've had and the one we're about to have. It's about genuine commitments designed by each country or each entity itself to be able to take real action and make the difference and includes not just countries, but non-state actors, the private sector, NGOs. And from the US to Chile, to the EU, to Indonesia, to Norway, to here in Palau, all of you who are here have helped to make very significant progress in what we are doing. Since 2014, this conference has mobilized more than 1,400 individual commitments worth more than $90 billion when quantified and protected more than 5 million square miles of the ocean. And this conference has from the very outset recognized the link between the ocean and climate you, above all the people in the world, understand that you can't solve the problem of the ocean without solving the climate crisis. Why? Because the climate crisis is what is producing the heating, the warming, and the pollution that is killing the ocean. And at the same time, you can't solve the problem of climate without the help of the ocean, which provides a nature-based solution in taking all of that heat and processing it, but also because it is the great climate temperature regulator. It is what governs the weather on a daily basis. So honesty requires us to come here to Palau and say that yes, we are making progress. This has been an awakening, a process of awakening. But also, we still need to do much more we gather here in the Pacific on the front lines of the crisis, both in our ocean and on our planet. Yes, we are making progress, but, and even as we acknowledge that so much is happening around the world, by any measure, you know, we know, we've been told again and again, most recently in the most recent IPCC report, that we must do so much more to avoid the worst consequences of this crisis. We need the full-throated voice of the island states, particularly, 
because you speak with a particular moral imperative, with a particular capacity to be persuasive. We need you to help make the difference. Why? Because there are still big developing nations in this world that are not cutting enough of that pollution that has the negative impact on the ocean and on the planet itself. Let me remind you, everybody, 20 countries, mine included, we're the second largest emitter, 20 countries are responsible for 80% of all the emissions on the planet. 20 countries. When we left Glasgow, 65% of global GDP of those 20 countries, basically, 65% had joined together with legitimate plans that, when measured, actually do keep faith with the goal of 1.5 degrees and put us within a shot of holding on to that 1.5 degrees. But as we agreed in Glasgow, this year and next year and these next few years must be the years in which the other 35% of those countries comes on board. Because if not, the mathematics and the physics tell us we don't make it. It's really that simple. This is not a design of some ideology or some president or prime minister anywhere in the world. This is what the science is telling us. And scientists have spent 35 years plus warning us of what is happening. And we have spent, too many of us in too many parts of the world, too much of those 35 years avoiding some of the responsibility. If we're going to keep 1.5 degrees, and the reason it's important is that every tenth of a degree of increase is catastrophic. As agreed in Glasgow, this year needs to be about implementation of the promises plus, and the plus is bringing other countries to the table to do more and helping, bringing the finance, bringing the technology, sharing it on a global basis. We all share this responsibility. In the most recent IPCC report, a scientist wrote very clearly, our house is already on fire. And that's too literal. In the tundra, in Siberia, in places where we never imagined fire, and in places where we've seen it before, but now with an intensity that we never believed possible. None of us are yet moving fast enough. So what is happening? I I'm going to just tell it the way I see it, and I know my good friend from the United States Senate, Sheldon Whitehouse, is here and shares this with me, a frustration about the obvious choices that we face and the willingness of people to fake it and to avoid responsibility. Too much money chasing too few fish. People who are pursuing the path, frankly, of giving in to the status quo, taking the path of least resistance, which happens to also produce the path of greatest destruction. We know, every single one of us, that it costs far more money in the trillions of dollars to deal with the damage if we don't invest those funds now. And the science tells us that every tenth of a degree matters enormously. Even with a 1.5 degree temperature rise, we may lose much of the coral reefs of the planet. Small fisheries we may lose. Crustaceans whose, whose hard uh, shells are affected enormously by the level of acidity in the ocean that comes from the acidity that drops from the sky in the form of rain and black carbon and so forth. Every day, the danger is compounded by indifference and inaction. And I ask you just to think about this. In the past half century, we have lost half of all marine populations. And 90% of large fish, like tuna, swordfish, the latest stats that I saw in order to fact check myself on this show that globally, not every fishery, individual fisheries can do something different, but globally, when we measure stocks, we are down to roughly 5% of the bluefin tuna population in the Pacific. And many of those that are left are too young to reproduce. So it's possible 
possible, I can't say with certainty, but the warning is pretty significant, that this could be one of the last generations of their species unless we change our behavior. Astonishingly, and I've asked my team again and again, how can this figure be correct, but they say it is, that we lose tens of millions, some say 100 million sharks every year, and in many cases, solely to cut their fin off and dump the carcasses overboard. And that practice is dramatically changing the predatory ladder of the oceans. Much of this is due to modern piracy, modern piracy of the seas, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. How many years have you heard about IUU? Countries in Asia alone, I regret to say, operate distant water fleets of more than 3,000 factory trawlers, mass-produced fish cash, and many of the crew are trafficked human beings, abused and barely paid wages for their work with no standards, no protections. The high seas of the world where we're trying to fight to bring the world together to get a high seas treaty long overdue, those high seas produce narcotics trafficking, human trafficking, guns and smuggling, and a lawlessness uh, that has uh, permitted rape and murder. They stretch illegally, these, these folks who fish in those high seas. They stretch illegal drift nets. Senator Ted Stevens and I, in the 1990s, took the drift net issue to the United Nations, and the United Nations banned drift net fishing. But the pirates don't care. They don't abide by the law. And if there's no one there to enforce them, they stretch those illegal drift nets out indiscriminately, smothering to death not just fish, but whales and dolphins, sea turtles. They have a word, two words, three words, four words for this. Feast today, famine tomorrow. Half of this catch is often thrown back into the ocean as unusable or unwanted bycatch. Waste is the word for it, tragedy. A single illegal factory ship catches as much in a week as a legal ship catches in a year. And when spotted, they often just cut their nets and flee. And then the nets become ghost fishing nets that rise and fall according to the carcasses that are trapped in them. To the members of the press who have traveled a great distance to be here, I urge you on a regular basis to help share these stories. It is imperative that we grow the outrage, that we expose what is happening and what is not happening. None of us can be content to accept that we are the prisoners of complacency. The fact is, we do still have time, according to the science, to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. That's the hope. Those are the possibilities. We can create millions of jobs and trillion dollar new industries. We can still reach a cleaner, safer, less polluted planet for all of us. But we can't do it if people keep pretending and keep turning away from reality, from facts. President Kennedy, when talking about the challenges of the world in the 1960s, said that our problems are caused by humans, most of them, and therefore they may be solved by humans. That remains true today, my friends. We humans are responsible for the crises of the ocean and the climate. We know what the solution is. We cannot allow ourselves to be manipulated and even lied to by bad actors who want to take the easiest path of least resistance. We have to fight the indifference. I know that we can win that fight. I'm absolutely confident of it. We've had great challenges before in history. Now, this requires us to rock the boat, to break the mold, to stand up and demand that we are going to achieve what we know we must achieve in order to win this battle. I remain convinced we will get to a low carbon, no carbon, no carbon economy in this world. We will get there. What we don't know and can't be guaranteed is will we get there in time to avoid the worst consequences of this crisis? And mind you, I am not saying in time to avoid the crisis. That's already baked in. It's to avoid the worst consequences. That's what the scientists have told us. So mind you, this is our challenge, 
And there are immediate things that we can do here in the next hours to make this happen. First, shipping. If shipping were a country, it would be the eighth largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. That has to change. Our first movers coalition that we created in Glasgow will bring leading companies together to help create green markets. And Maersk, the largest container shipper in the world, has stepped up and they have pledged that the next eight ships that they build will be carbon free. That's the kind of action that we need and that's how we win. The United States is working with countries in the International Maritime Organization to adopt a goal of zero emissions from international shipping no later than 2050. Second, offshore renewable energy. We must dramatically scale up onshore and offshore renewable energy, including offshore wind. This is doable. Fatih Birol and the IEA, the International Energy Agency, have told us that in order to hold on to the 1.5 degrees, we need to be deploying renewables five times faster than we are today. We need to be shutting coal plants five times faster than we are today. We need to be deploying electric vehicles 22 times faster than we are today. That's the challenge, and that's why we're here in Palau, to accept that challenge. President Biden has committed the United States to deploy at least 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And we ask all others to consider what they can do to join in that effort. Third, marine nature-based solutions. We can't win the battle without nature-based solutions. And we're committed to helping to conserve and protect at least 30% of the global ocean. And remember, that doesn't mean, it means globally you begin to measure whether or not you're achieving that goal. We have a goal to conserve U.S. waters by at least 30 percent by 2030. It's not a stopping point. And we encourage all nations to do the same. Fourth, as I mentioned, the illegal unreported where we must begin to put together a means of enforcement, folks. There are always going to be malefactors, people who are willing to break the law for some gain. But if there's no enforcement, there are going to be a lot more of it. When I was a young man and I was in the United States Navy transiting the Pacific Ocean on a ship, I remember how bored we were, desperate for some distraction. Uh, and, and, and the fact is that if we had had to divert 20 miles, 30 miles, and go through a fishery and maybe do a board and search exercise, which would have been good for all of us, we could have had some kind of enforcement. We need to do that. We need to begin to bring together our Coast Guards, our militaries, our enforcement mechanism, the digital capacity we have in the world today to measure and know what people are doing and put it to work in the interests of humanity. IUU fishing employs human trafficking, money laundering, fraud, to disregard treaties, evade protected areas, destroy lives in the ocean. Those factory ships put little skiffs out at night. They sit on the edge of the EEZ. They go into the EEZ. They rob the local community blind and then go out and sell the fish. Undercutting honest enterprises. Finally, we need to get serious about plastic. We look forward to beginning the negotiation of a new agreement on plastic, and over the next two days, we're going to see hundreds of commitments worth billions of dollars to try to deal with this. But think about this, folks. I just learned this the other day. We humans, involuntarily, are now taking into our bodies on a weekly basis in microplastics the equivalent of one credit card of plastic a week. For our part, I want to happily say the United States is going to announce over 100 commitments worth $2.7 billion, including contributions from at least 13 different departments and agencies. And on coastal resilience, uh, we're going to help uh, put a million dollars at least in supporting the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance. And the mission of the Alliance is to drive at least $500 million of investment. On shipping, we've worked with Denmark and the Marshall Islands to double the number of signatories for declaration on zero emission shipping by 2050. We've worked with the United Kingdom to add signatories to the Clyde Bank Declaration and much more. My friends, we're also uh, uh, going to provide additional protection here in the Pacific to the uh, Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument by redesignating it as a national marine sanctuary. And on marine pollution, 
The EPA is going to provide $350 million in grants over the next five years to improve recycling in our country to help prevent the plastics from ever showing up in the ocean. So my friends, we have our work cut out for us, but it is great work. It is work that can excite the human imagination and bring people to this table whereby we actually do protect the ocean for future generations, for our children and our grandchildren. This week and beyond, we can take the steps necessary to break the mold. Let's rock the boat, my friends, and get the job done. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but my special climate envoy, John Kerry, former Secretary of State, is leading our delegation. He's the best. And I want to thank, I want to thank the government and the people of Palau for welcoming the world to, its, uh, to this important gathering. For Palau and for island states around the world, the health of our ocean isn't only about conservation for the future. It's about survival today. We can no longer delay action on climate change that's warming our oceans, on pollution that's poisoning marine habitats, on plastics that fill the sea with trash, on overfishing that destroys delicate marine ecosystems. And you know, look, when it comes to our oceans, our climate ambitions, and the very survivability of the planet, this is a decisive decade. We all have to act. In the United States, my administration has made tackling the climate crisis a top priority. We're moving to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind and energy by 2030. We're working together with other countries to implement green carters to get international shipping sectors to zero emissions by 2050. We're conserving at least 30% of U.S. waters by 2030. We're countering illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and forced labor at sea to ensure sustainability in legal seafood and fisheries. Look, my administration will be announcing several new commitments over the next two days. Protecting our oceans is the responsibility of every human on Earth. Simply put, without the oceans, life is not possible. So I want to thank all of you, especially the young people who are leading the world on this issue all around the world to protect our oceans and to keep it healthy. Thank you all very, very much.